outreach pastor in Edson. I work alongside uh, <laughs> and some of you know him because he's shared here before. Um, my husband Daniel here, he works at a gas plant near Edson as an instrumentation electrician. We work in different fields, but we also love to work in the ministry of hospitality. Um, so today we're going to be preaching together. As we were preparing to come and speak to you this morning, we were thinking about this time last year and what was happening. And something that you guys experienced and our community also experienced with those unprecedented forest fires and the evacuations that we went through last May. So as it gets closer to the first days of May, we have been feeling increasingly anxious about what is to come. And I know the same feeling seems to be spreading all through Edson, and I imagine that you guys are feeling a little bit of that here too. Even as, even as we think about it now, I can feel that anxiety rising, knowing that there will likely be some forest fires again this year in this dry and predictable end of winter, end of spring, beginning of summer, in these first couple of weeks of May. And as Christians, we believe that God is able to save us and can supernaturally intercede in our lives. And oftentimes he does. And sometimes he does not. Sometimes he helps, and sometimes he seems to wait for longer than we would like. So with that in mind, we want to take a look today at the story in the Bible where God's people needed help. Before we look at this story, I want to point out that this story has more than one application. And we will be looking at obedience as well. But our text this morning is Daniel 3, 1 to 30, and we're going to read it in sections as we're preaching. So if you want to find Daniel 3, and we'll start at verse 1, and we're going to read the first six verses to start off with. Daniel 3, and we're reading from the New International Version, starting in verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, nations and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. I want to stop here in the story for a second. The king of Babylon has built a statue in his own honor. Not only that, but he has commanded the leaders in his community to bow down to it and worship when the music plays. In this passage, as well as other sections in the book of Daniel, we can see that King Nebuchadnezzar is an incredibly proud and volatile king. The amount of resources he would have had available in order to make a statue of this height was incredible. How tall is 90 feet? I was trying to visualize it and, and to compare it, like the size of a drilling rig would be higher than 90 feet or the size of like a, a double, I don't know if that's right, but a, a, a fairly large service rig would be a little bit smaller than the statue. So kind of in that Height. So if you can imagine driving, you'd see it from a distance. Uh, for those of us who don't know anything about rigs at all, um, I'm going to talk in terms of school buses because that's what I can see. So it's like two to three school buses stacked on end. Um, but I want to pause also and acknowledge the cultural setting of this story. Um, the Hebrew men in this story would have been acutely aware that they were not in their own home. These men were trying to continue to follow God in the midst of a culture that was back and forth between ignorant of their God and openly hostile. The nation they were living in was led by a man who was completely self-centered. Nebuchadnezzar was wildly wealthy, and his priority was not to distribute the wealth and help the country prosper, 
but in stark contrast, he makes a statue and demands worship. We don't see a lot of statues being built in our cultural setting today. However, I think we can identify a little bit in living with a culture that is increasingly antagonistic towards um, what we believe as Christians. Not only that, but Nebuchadnezzar pressured all of the leaders in his province to prove their allegiance to him by worshiping him. I would suggest that in some ways our political leaders are providing pressure for the citizens of our country to accept beliefs that are not congruent to Christianity. I'm not trying to make this about a political message in any way, but rather I wanted just to indicate that we share some common points. So let's continue to read on in verse 7. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all nations and all peoples of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, so these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods and worship the image of gold that I have set up? Now when you hear the, horn, the sound of the horn, the flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I have made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? The first point that we want to bring out of this passage is this. The situation was impossible. The king was demanding that everyone bow down and worship him, which was not an option for the Hebrew man. I can't help but suspect that everybody else in the province of Dura that was supposed to also worship and bow down, I can't help but wonder, maybe they weren't worshiping Nebuchadnezzar with their whole hearts. Maybe they were just bowing down because that was expected of them. It would have been easy just to follow along in a large group of people like that. Maybe just, I mean, at the very least, if, if these men weren't going to bow down to worship, at least, like, bend down and tie up your shoes when everyone else is, is bowing down so you don't draw any attention to yourself. Yet that was also not an option. I find it interesting as well. If you look at the previous chapter, this same volatile king had had a dream that he needed interpreted. So he asked all the, w the wise men in, in the country to interpret it, and none of them, they were all willing to do it, but he didn't want to tell them the dream first. Daniel was the, the only one who could come, tell him the dream, and then tell him the interpretation. And at the end of that whole ordeal, the king said, he said this, and this is in Daniel 2.47, the he said that Daniel's God was the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. And he said to Daniel, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Now, ironically, this dream that King Nebuchadnezzar had was about a giant statue that is ultimately destroyed. I don't understand how it, the king could have a dream about a statue being destroyed and then say to himself, Perhaps I'll make a statue of me. So in this situation, we have a very impossible situation for the Hebrew men. We find that after the first call to worship the statue, some astrologers came forward to tattle on them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And we can see from the tone of their complaint in verse 12 that the intent of the astrologers was not to bring gentle correction, but they meant to cause trouble. They were there to cause issues. And true to his nature, King Nebuchadnezzar overreacts, is filled with rage, and even though he was very clear with his expectations, Nebuchadnezzar did 
Unfortunately, this only makes the, the situation more difficult and more impossible for them. Now there's no secretly pretending to worship. Their next actions will very clearly indicate whether they are willing to conform to the pressures around them or if they will honor God. So let's read verse 16 and 17. Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. So in the face of an impossible situation, these three men responded with such a calm confidence. In stark contrast to the volatile king and the arrogance of him, who was always threatening to kill and violently hurt somebody, these men answer, answered with so much composure. And not only were they able to calmly answer, they also chose to honor God. And that brings us to our second point. They chose an uncomfortable obedience. You see in this passage such a strong confidence in God to begin with. They trusted God and what he was able to do. Not only that, but their allegiance to God was not dependent on whether or not he would dramatically rescue them. I find it interesting that these men had such confidence in God. As Hebrew boys, they of course would have been required to know the Torah, know the scriptures, and they would have been very, very familiar with the history of God taking care of his people. That would have been burned into their minds. But they would have also very uh, well remembered what it was like to be torn from their own home country. They would have remembered the feeling of being under a lengthy siege. It was Nebuchadnezzar himself who came and besieged Jerusalem, waited for the people to, to give up, and then took the country, took that city. So the, in the same amount that they would have remembered what God did in the Bible, they would have also very keenly remembered what had happened to them. I don't know how old these boys were when the city was taken, or even if they lived inside Jerusalem, but I'm sure they would not have forgotten being ripped from their country. If I was in their position, I might have been tempted to give up on a God who lets another country come and take me captive. Are you ever in that place? Have you ever struggled with understanding how to trust God when you feel like he's let you down? Now we come to the part in the story that I love the most. It's in verse 18, and we read, But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. They simply said, God can save us, and he will save us, but if he doesn't, we will still obey him. I love that phrase, even if he does not. To me, it shows such a strong understanding of who God is. For those of us who are parents, we know that our kids ask a lot of things from us, and we don't always say yes. If I was a multimillionaire, I don't think that I would give my kids everything that they ask for. In fact, I think it would probably be better for them if I didn't do that, if I said no to some of the things they were asking, maybe made them work for it themselves. But that doesn't change how much I love my children. I think it shows the love that I have for them by not giving them everything they want but instead giving them what they need. Here in these men, we see such a confidence that if God does not rescue him, it is not because he's unable. These men looked at the options available and decided that honoring God was worth it, even if it turned out to result in their death. Let's continue on to read in Daniel 3. We're at verse 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, 
Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around on the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. And the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was the hair of their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other god can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Our third point this morning is that God dramatically rescued him, rescued them. I love this story about how God came and dramatically rescued and protected the three Hebrew men from the raging inferno. However, if I was in this story, I think I would have been a little irritated by how long it took for God to show up and rescue me. From my perspective, there would have been a lot of moments leading up to the furnace that would have been good moments for God to jump in and say, not so fast, Nebuchadnezzar. Maybe, maybe right after the man had said that, that incredible phrase, even if he does not save us, we will not bow down to your statue, then, blam, an angel comes in and saves them. That didn't happen. Or maybe... After the men were tied up and the strongest men in, in the kingdom were there to ready to throw them in the fire, one, two, and then, whoa, this angel steps out, not today. Those would have been good moments in my mind for God to rescue them. Yet, God waits until the men were thrown into the furnace. As I was reading this passage, I was reminded of Max Lucado's commentary on this section. He was he was writing about how tools or instruments don't get the credit for the work that is completed. Like a scalpel doesn't say like, well, I just did a good surgery. Like it's not the scalpel or the paintbrush, it's the artist and the surgeon that gets credit for the work that's done. And that's how God wants to work in our lives as well, to take the credit for him to receive the glory for what has happened. When God showed up in the fire, that might have seemed like the first time that God showed up. By contrast, this was the first time in the story that he revealed himself in that visible way. He was there all along. He stood beside them. He was part of their story. And I feel like he did that to bring the glory back to God so that it was beyond a shadow of a doubt, a miracle, and there was no way they could have achieved that on their own. God showed up in a powerful and radical way and even took the time to walk around in the furnace with these men. I wonder if they talked to the fourth man in the fire. I feel like if this happened today, there'd just be a whole lot of high fives and, and hugs and stuff going around. And like I said earlier, I love the way God rescues these men. But as I read the story, I'm struck by how long it took for God to intervene. And this has been my experience and our experience in our own lives. God has never let us down, but on a number of occasions, he waited till res to respond until we were certain it was too late. I remember uh, showing up for an orthodontist appointment for my son, Hayden. Um, he's got cleft lip and palate, and so there's a, a series of treatments that we have to go through, and surgeries, and orthodontists, and braces, and spacers, and all kinds of stuff that we have to go through and deal with. and and. Uh, I knew full well on the way into that appointment that I had no money to pay for this. And I had no clue how I was going to get through that. And I, I felt tense as I was driving in. And I, I think Hayden, he was only eight at the time, but he could see me through the little mirror that we have in our van. And he asked me what was wrong. And 
I just said, oh, it's just, mom's just struggling with some things. It's not a big deal. And, and he just said, you know, mom, I learned at Sunrise Camp this summer that we have to count our blessings ton by ton, not one by one. And it just, it just struck me so deep to remember all of the blessings that we did have, even if I didn't have anything in that moment and didn't know how we were going to get through that next moment. We had been given so many blessings, and I had so much to be thankful for. And that gave me a peace as I was driving the rest of the way in. And I arrived at the appointment. Um, we went through the course of the treatment plan and all the things that were coming up next and what was expected. And, and I asked them if they could just give me an estimate of the cost so I would know what to expect. And the administrative lady excused herself to go talk to the orthodontist. And then the orthodontist himself came back into the room and he explained to me that the clinic was going to completely cover the cost of this next phase of treatment. And I know from the treatments we've had before, it was over $4,500. And it was a big thing. I, I broke down and just cried. And I gave him a big hug. I don't think he was expecting that. It's kind of awkward a little bit. But, um, but it was just such a powerful moment of remembering and recognizing that God, it might have seemed like the last moment but he showed up just in time and saved us from what we, what we needed. Like the story of these three men, I would have much preferred a dramatic rescue from God way sooner. Maybe the previous appointment would have been a good time to tell me that. Or maybe even a couple of days before, a letter in the mail or if on the drive-in, God just whispered, hey, just so you know, we're going to cover this cost. But regardless of the fact of the timing or when the timing occurred, or what I preferred, the fact is that God took care of us. The story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was primarily a story of obedience in the face of opposition to God. I also think it has a lesson for us about how we can calmly and confidently follow God, knowing that He is still good, even if we don't get rescued in the way we wanted to. Remember, the story of the whole Bible is the story of how God has provided a way to eternally rescue us. God does promise to eternally rescue us, but God does not promise that he will rescue us from every inconvenience along the way. That is our goal today, to guide you to understand that God is good and cares deeply about you, and to get you and to get our hearts to a place where we can say God is able and he will rescue me and if he doesn't I'll still obey him and as these next few weeks unfold and as the forest fires inevitably come to this area and come to our area I want you to remind yourselves as we remind ourselves in Edson that God can rescue us and even if he doesn't, we will still trust that he is good. I want to close um, our message this morning by reading a verse from Ephesians 3, 20 to 21. It's one of my absolute favorites. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. We have one last song.